Good evening and welcome. I'm Pauline Yu, president of ACLS, and I am very pleased to introduce the 2016 Charles Homer Haskins Prize Lecturer, Professor Cynthia Enlow. This is the 34th year of the Haskins Prize Lecture Series, which is named in honor of the first chairman of the American Council of Learned Societies, Charles Homer Haskins. Each year, the executive committee of the delegates to the ACLS selects a lecturer from the many worthy nominations put forward by our community. You'll find a list of previous prize winners in your program. Haskins lecturers are asked to reflect on a lifetime of work as a scholar, on the motives, the chance determinations, the satisfactions, and the dissatisfactions of the life of learning, and to explore through one's own life the larger institutional life of scholarship. We do not wish the speaker to present the products of one's own scholarly research, but rather to share with other scholars the personal process of a particular lifetime of learning. Many have called Professor Cynthia Enloe the founder of Feminist International Relations for arguing and demonstrating that only through making women's experiences visible can we understand politics in general and international relations in particular. One simple question has shaped her life of learning. Where are the women? Answering this question has resulted in a mere 14 single authored books and dozens of journal articles, book chapters, edited volumes, and co-authored books. It has also taken her scholarship and her influence across the globe, from investigations into banana plantations in Honduras, sneaker factories in Korea, and Gurkha military bases in Nepal, to guest professorships in Japan and Britain, to lectures in Iceland, Turkey, and Vietnam. Her writings have been translated into 10 languages. Where are the women? As the letter nominating Professor Enloe for this honor stated, answering this simple but revealing question is an approach that has yielded enormous and important insights into the workings of politics and social policy and speaks to urgent questions of humanity in eloquent and thoughtful ways. As you will hear, I'm sure, in Professor Enloe's talk, motivating this question are a limitless and self-conscious curiosity, a dedication to peace, and the courage to expose how and where power operates. I will note that she's prepared to take questions after her lecture, should you wish to pose them, considering continuing with a format that we have introduced earlier in this program. As a reviewer of her book, The Curious Feminist Notes, Professor Enloe calls our attention to questions we might not have thought of as questions, and also encourages her readers to develop these same habits of curiosity. By looking for women in places where they seem to be absent, Professor Enloe exposes the political workings of masculinity and femininity, examines how cultures and systems become patriarchal, probes into the global phenomenon of the militarization of women, and demands that women's lives and women's impact on international politics and the global economy be taken seriously. Professor Enloe's work is notable for its clarity and accessibility. Reviewers of her work consistently remark on her ability to explain complex ideas in plain language. One reviewer commends her as an unusual scholar who is committed to making political theorizing part of the hubbub of the public arena, quoting Professor Enloe. She does this by adopting an unpretentious writing style that weaves her personal intellectual journey into her research, and by using colorful and wide-ranging examples to illustrate nuanced ideas about feminist international politics. Her perhaps best-known work, Bananas, Beaches, and Bases, which came out as a completely revised second edition in 2014, takes readers into the lives of Caribbean cham chambermaids in resort hotels, Sri Lankan domestic workers in US homes, Thai mail order brides, Chinese global tourists, and Bangladeshi garment workers. As Professor Enlo will share with us tonight, she hasn't always been a feminist. Her self-conscious cultivation of her own feminist curiosity pervades her work and inspires her audience, women and men, to do the same. Professor Enloe's scholarly contributions extend far beyond Clark University, where she's been on the faculty since 1972, and helped found and then directed the university's women's studies program. She's a thoughtful teacher, a dedicated administrator and editorial board member, and a noted international public intellectual. 
At Clark, she's been awarded the Outstanding Teacher Award three times, and she's a true teacher scholar. Her scholarship is influenced by her students, and students across the humanities and social sciences read her work in their undergraduate courses. In her words, learn from your students, love teaching. She has published in Ms. Magazine and has appeared on National Public Radio, Al Jazeera, C-SPAN, and the BBC. Professor Enloe was the 2007 recipient of the Susan Strange Award from the International Studies Association, which recognizes a person whose singular intellect, assertiveness, and insight most challenge conventional wisdom and intellectual and organizational complacency in the international studies community. Indeed, Professor Enloe's career as an inquisitive scholar, engaged teacher, passionate activist, and public intellectual exemplify these values, which are central to humanistic inquiry. Please join me in welcoming Cynthia Enloe. Um, when we were doing this arranging, I said, you know, podiums are really made for people who are over five foot two. Right? And so I'm a kind of beside the podium kind of speaker. Um, it's a delight to be here. I'm honored uh, to be uh, the Charles Haskins speaker. And I learned that Charles Haskins himself was at the Versailles peace treaty um, negotiations. Um, and so that made me all the more uh, pleased to be part of something in his honor. I also, of course, was completely daunted by, I, it was really a mistake. I read all the list of everyone else who had gotten this, you know, Helen Vendler and Clifford Geertz, and I thought, oh, good grief. Well, I, I figured, stand up, be five foot one and proud, uh, <laughs> and go for it. Um, um, I also have to say that the ACLS giving every speaker the same theme is just inspired the idea of trying to do an archaeological dig on one's own learning, um, which is oftentimes embarrassing, at least for me, because the learning comes kind of late, um, is, is just, it was very, very interesting uh, to try and do, and to do with some candor. Um, and it's not the tell-all speech, but still to, to really try and understand why it took me so long to become a feminist. That's really what this talk is about. Why did it take me so long? And what happened when my eyes were finally open? Um, my parents um, both uh, come from the British Isles stock, if you will, uh, but by very different directions. Um, the Enlows, um, I was asked at college, uh, well, there was an assignment of my classmates um, to find out um, what was the ethnic or national origin of every class name in the freshman class. And I came back from a weekend away on Sunday, I guess late afternoon, early evening, and literally in my dorm was a group of my classmates saying, you're it, you're the only one, we, who, are, what are you? What, what is Enlo? And I really, I only had kind of my um, father's folklore, since we've got the Association of Folklorists here. Um, I only had my father's folklore, which was we were Scotch-Irish, which I had no, I really didn't even know what that meant. But it gave an answer. And for my classmates, it was good enough to submit uh, for their Monday assignment. Um, but it turns out that, in fact, Enloe is Dutch and Scotch and Irish, and that the Enlows came to the United States, well, to the New World, um, in the 1630s. Um, I think that they were really a very restless lot. Um, and you know, one of the reasons I think one gets interested in family history is because really you're not so much an historian, you're trying to figure out your parents. And what family history, no matter how folklorist it is, um, helps you do is figure out, oh, that's why dad's the way he is, right? <laughs> and so the kind of restlessness 
uh, geographic of the Enlos um, was very uh, helpful in my trying to figure him out. He was a very big personality, uh, short, but a big personality. Um, and um, one of the stories he liked to tell um, was about uh, the Enlos out on the, what the Euro, uh, Euro frontier people called the frontier um, in the 18, uh, 50s and 60s, uh, being uh, farmers, poor farmers, I think, um, but owning land uh, out on what was then the Missouri-Kentucky frontier. And my father's story was that Abraham, watch it now, Abraham Enlow was a, uh, a farmer out in uh, Kentucky, and he had working for him as a paid farmhand, Nancy Hanks. You can see where the story is going to go. Um, and the story was that my father was very proud of, um, which meant that my brother and I were very skeptical of, um, th was that Abraham Enlow um, actually fathered Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and so given that it was my father's story, um, I dismissed it completely out of hand. My brother was just totally embarrassed by the story, um, although he's about the height of Abraham Lincoln. Um, and then it took off on social media. So you go on the web and you do Abraham Enlow, Abraham Lincoln, just, you know, it's all over the place, which is even more embarrassing. But it means that the things that your father tells you don't necessarily stay in the family. Uh, they begin to have a life of their own. Um, the Goodrich side of the family, which is my mother's side of the family, at least on her father's side, also came over during an agricultural recession in, then in England, um, came first to the East Coast and uh, to northern New York. Um, by the time that uh, my, father, my mother's father, who I, I never knew any of my grandparents, by the way. I never met a single grandparent. Um, so everything is folklore. Um, but um, Ira Goodrich, my, my mother's father, uh, was in upstate New York. He married. He had a daughter. Um, his first wife died. And he moved out uh, to California. Um, and he became a hotel owner out in California. He married a divorcee from Minnesota, Francis, whose parents were Welsh poor farming immigrants. And she, after a unsuccessful marriage, um, also moved out to California. Now, one of the things, and they met in California, a divorcee and a widower met in California. This is the perfect California story. Um, and um, out of that union came my mother, Harriet. Now, one of the things I think I gathered from this long before I was a feminist, certainly, was that the myth of the American nuclear family was a myth. Certainly, most of the families history that I tried to trace, you, when you're the daughter of somebody where the, your grandmother was a divorcee, marries a widower who was from upper New York State, there, the, my mother's nieces were her age. So I had to learn, well, now wait, who's Aunt Betty to my mother? And my mother used to love to tell boyfriends, she tells me, um, that she would love to go out with them, but you know, she would have to take her nieces with her. And they turned out, of course, to be these lively women of the same age, right? But so learning family history, part of the learning was that, in fact, I learned early that families never were uncomplicated. They were always complicated, and they oftentimes were on the move. By the time my mother was born, and her mother died when she was 12, that's Frances, uh, the daughter of the Welsh uh, immigrants, um, my grandfather, see, you're already confused, aren't you? Uh, all right. But this is good, isn't it, right? There's no simple linear story of American families. Um, but my grandfather, uh, um, Ira Goodrich, um, 
decided that he, that young Harriet, I love this image, young Harriet was too much of a handful. Um, don't you love listening to stories about your mother before you knew your mother? Um, and so um, he sent back east to a young widow to come out and work at the hotel and really kind of take charge of teenage Harriet. Um, and she was Lil Holden. Now, the reason the story means a lot to me is because my middle name is Holden. My mother named her firstborn, I'm the older of my, um, the two siblings in the family. Um, she chose not to give as ordinarily happens in a lot of white Christian families, not to give her maiden name as her firstborn's middle name, but to give Lil Holden's name. So I don't use it when I started publishing as a feminist, I dropped the H. It just sounded too formal. So you can trace back and see my, if you will, pre-feminist books are written by Cynthia H. Enloe, and my feminist books, if you will, are written as just Cynthia Enloe. But I hated dropping the H, but I felt I felt I had to do it. I just, I wanted not, I wanted to be a little more approachable and dropping the H felt as though I could do that. But the Holden part really means, I didn't know her either. Um, the Holden part really feels important to me because it feels as though Lil Holden really was a modern woman. She really assumed that my mother would start drive. I don't think there were any driver's licenses in California when my mother was growing up. And she started driving from Santa Barbara, where this hotel Upham is, still is, um, up to Mills College in a car she called Betsy. And I think she went to college early. I think she was 17, driving what must have been a 10-hour drive up the California coast. Lil Holden also was very adventurous. They went on horseback riding trips. They went to Europe. Um, and so the Holden part uh, really feels important because, again, it feels to me as if it was before I had any feminist consciousness, I knew that there were Lil Holdens in American society. That is, that there were adventurous women who had been widowed, but that didn't stop them living. And also they migrated out to California, they took charge of this handful called my mother, and. Um, and really encouraged her to have um, an adventurous life. My parents met, and my German friends love this story, they met in Heidelberg. Now, if you, those of you who do German studies know that Heidelberg is full of romantic folklore, and so the idea of this young uh, American man and woman meeting outside a restaurant in um, Heidelberg was very um, believable, if you will. Uh, but my father was there because he was from Missouri, um, but his father went bankrupt in the Depression, and so you could go to the best medical schools in um, Germany for $25 a semester. And so off he went, to, he didn't speak any German, um, off he went to Germany to do his medical studies. Um, they lived, my Parents had a whirlwind romance, I gather. Um, and um, they then settled while my father finished med school, um, first in Heidelberg, then in Munich, then in Berlin, because in the med school system in Germany, you could move from campus to campus to campus and still get the same degree. Um, but they were there during the rise of Hitler. It had a profound effect on my father, who was earning some money as a stringer for the Kansas City Star and would try to write home articles, which I've now dug up and found, um, that were trying to alert complacent Americans about what was happening in Germany in the 1930s. My mother did not dramatize her life very much. The only story she would tell was that she was once at a rally, out, got caught up in a rally on the street in Munich. Um, and where the, uh, the Nazi party was particularly strong, and said how terrifying it was to be in a crowd of people who were so enthusiastic for the Nazis and for Hitler and her not putting up her hand um, in the salute. 
and how pressured she was by people around her to do that. Um, and what she remembered was simply the terror of being in a crowd of, of enthusiasts um, who were threatening to somebody who didn't share their enthusiasm. Um, my parents, when they came back to the US, uh, my father with a medical degree, um, lived on Long Island. In fact, Candace and I were just sharing stories about Long Island, um, and in a town called Manhasset. Now, when we were growing up in Manhasset, there was this, nobody taught, nobody taught local history. So you'd think in grammar school, you'd think in junior high or high school, somebody would have thought that if you're living in a town called Manhasset, what a great way to introduce Native American history, right? <laughs> no, there was never a single conversation in any classroom about the origins of the name of this town. In fact, it's a Matinecock name, I've now learned, Matinecock being the local um, native group that lived on Long Island before the Dutch came. Um, and it means simply island neighborhood. But of course, we made up, you know, histories as kids do. So we decided that Manhasset must have been an Indian chief. And the high school named their sports teams, the Manhasset High School, named their sports teams the Indians. And here's the secret. Well, it's not a secret. Here's the embarrassment. They still do. Right? So when you think of the Redskins case now about to come up in the courts, just think about all the high schools that still call themselves the Braves or the Indians or a local Indian name. Um, the other thing that we were pretty unconscious about was the degree of racial segregation in this northern New York suburban community. We knew it, we as kids, knew it only because it wasn't till high school that we had African American classmates. All the way through elementary school, all the way through uh, junior high, they were all white student bodies. It was only when we got to high school that the, the schools from Spinney Hill, which was the African American uh, redlined neighborhood in Manhasset merged at the high school level, and that's when you had white and African American students together in the same school. So we had an idea. We knew, I mean, we had a racialized geography. We knew that Spinney Hill was where African Americans lived. Um, we knew we had no African American uh, neighbors, um, but nobody talked about uh, the racialization of northern suburbs or why or how it happened and the role of banks and the role of realtors. There was no discussion of that at all. Um, the other thing that was going on in town, which we barely knew about, and I understand that last year, is this true for some of you who are here? Last year you had the Great Neck Acapo the Great Neck Choir sing the Great Neck High School fight song. Is that true for those of you who are here? Well, it just shows how boring Manhasset was. We didn't have the Agapaka, you know, uh, fight song group, unfortunately. We were right next door, but here's what we knew growing up. This is how you, well, how any of us imbibe racism, but we don't think to inquire about it, and that is we knew as kids in Manhasset, you got on the Long Island Railroad, which started in Port Washington. It went Port Washington, Roslyn, Manhasset, Great Neck, Little Neck, and on into the city. We lived on the Long Island Railroad. But we knew that Great Neck was a Jewish community, which meant we knew we weren't. I don't know, I have never seen a history of anti-Semitism and the history of this suburb, Manhasset. But I, and so I don't know how it worked. I do know that by the time I was in high school, there were more Jewish families in the neighborhood. And the reason we knew it is because our parents mentioned it. Didn't exclude them necessarily. I'm sure there was overt anti-Semitism at some level, but it was mentioned as if that's worthy of mentioning. 
The way it came up institutionally is that Manhasset, if any of you know Long Island, Manhasset is a, a Long Island Sound Harbor community. So there were three boating clubs. Um, and there was the Port Washington Yacht Club, the Manhasset Yacht Club, that's what my parents belonged to, and the Knickerbocker Club. And the Knickerbocker Club, we all knew, was a Jewish boating club. Not Manhasset Yacht Club, not Port Washington Yacht Club. So this town taught us nothing about our Native American histories and what happened to the Matinecocks. It was a racially segregated town, um, and it was a town that at least was threaded through with anti-Semitism. But none of that was overtly talked about. It was only later that we became, at least some of us, became really curious about it, to try and think, well, what kind of, what was our hometown? How did it get to be that way? The Long Island Railroad, as I mentioned, really was the lifeblood um, of the, this suburb. And it, it was both mass, the Long Island Railroad was both masculized and feminized, depend which time of day you went down to the Long Island Railroad and whether the train was coming out or going into the city. So this is the way it worked. Um, Amy Richter here is a specialist in the gendered history of trains. Um, so this will sound not unfamiliar. And that is that my mother, a white suburban middle class woman, um, no longer working as what she was trained for to be a, a, a early childhood teacher. Um, my mother would drive my father really in a Ford station wagon. I mean, you can't make it up, right? In a Ford station wagon down in the morning for him to catch the Long Island Railroad into the city with all the other fathers in town um, for their office jobs. It was a masculinized train at 7.55 in the morning going into the city. And then my mother and her other suburban white middle class friends in their cars would hover around the railroad station and the trains coming out from Queens would come and they would be carrying African American women to clean the houses of the white suburban households. So it was a feminized train coming out from Queens um, at that point, about 8.30 in the morning. It was a masculinized white train going into the city um, a half hour before that. And I th the name of the woman who uh, worked as a cleaner um, at, for my mother, um, I don't think my father ever met her, um, was named Betty Scudders. And I think about Betty a lot. Um, Betty. Um, was called Betty by my brother and me. Um, children, calling an adult woman. I didn't call any other adult woman by her first name. At most, I would call somebody Aunt somebody, um, or Mrs. Miller, or Mrs. Deneen. I didn't call them by their first name. But Betty Scudder, an adult woman, we, my brother and I, called her Betty. Um, and she called my mother Mrs. Enlow. I think about Betty a lot, Betty Scudders a lot, because when I later on became really interested in the international politics of domestic work, um, I thought back of all the Betty Scudders in the world. Betty Scudders had emigrated from North Carolina up to New York to do this uh, paid work. Um, other women around the world, as Pauline mentioned um, in the introduction, um, are now emigrating from Sri Lanka, the Philippines, especially Sri Lanka and the Philippines, but also from Mexico and Ecuador um, across state lines um, to do that work. But I, as I was beginning to really get interested in the domestic uh, workers' politics, and they're now very much organized, and if you come from a state, um, you might be aware uh, in your state legislature that there's a lot of mobilized uh, activity now by domestic workers and caregivers. They've made an alliance um, to try and get them treated 
as workers. Because under ILO, that's International Labor Organization, understanding of work until about five years ago, domestic workers were not considered workers. Doing paid domestic work was considered being a companion, not real workers. And in state legislature after state legislature in the United States and in parliaments around the world, there are exemptions from labor rights legislation for domestic workers. The exemption is to deprive them of their rights. So my thinking about Betty Scudder's today is so that I can really understand complicity, understand my complicity, understand my mother's complicity, understand all the kinds of racialized um, and patriarchal ideas that went into uh, making for a low-paid uh, domestic worker workforce deprived of, of rights. One of the best uh, poems about um, African-American domestic workers is by Kate Russian. And some of you may know the poetry of Kate Russian. She's an African-American feminist um, now living in near Hartford. And she, one of her most famous poems is called The Backup Girls. And she's also a poetry performer. And so if you can ever actually listen to her on YouTube or invite her to your campuses, um, get her to perform The Backup Girls because it's about her aunts who worked as domestic workers and acted as backup girls, if you will. Um, so Manhasset was a very interesting place to now reflect upon um, and to realize what, how lack of curiosity is so profoundly shaping one's life, what you are taught not to notice, what you are encouraged not to ask, what you are um, nurtured to think doesn't matter or doesn't matter to you. Um, I went to um, Connecticut College for Women, I think partly because I heard these great stories about my mother's life at Mills, Mills College out in California. And I thought, getting caught out on the fire escape during a fire drill, that sounds great. I, you know, I want to go to a women's college. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I, it really, it was, it was exciting to think that, um, that I could go from a public high school with all the social pressures of a social, of uh, a public high school and go to an all women's college. Now at Connecticut College, which was then, it's now co-ed, it was then Connecticut College for Women, um, there were a lot of, of women faculty. I mean, that was just fabulous. I mean, I'd had, of course, wonderful women teachers in high school and grade school, but now I also had wonderful women faculty in political science, um, in history, in literature. Um, but none of them taught anything about women. And I think about that a lot now. I think about because they were amongst their first generation, I think, to have gotten PhDs and gotten tenured faculty jobs at colleges and universities. And yet, they buried that. So we did not read Mary Wollstonecraft in um, political theory. We didn't read uh, Virginia Woolf in literature. We didn't read anything about suffragists in any history course. And in fact, out of my guilt about that, um, I assign three guineas uh, constantly to students. I'm now on my fourth edition. Don't you have books that you've taught again and again, and you've made up so many marks on them that you actually they become unusable, and you go on, you get a new copy, and you move along? Well, I'm on to my fourth copy of, of um, Three Guineas. Um, if you haven't read it, make a point to read it. Um, but I also teach about suffragists. And I teach about the suffrage movements um, in Iceland and the suffrage movements in Brazil and the suffrage movements in uh, Egypt. That's Margot Bodron's wonderful uh, book. Um, and as well as about suffrage movements in uh, Japan and Britain and the United States. But I partly got so enthusiastic, and I am still very enthusiastic about learning about suffrage history cross-nationally because I'm so curious about why my professors at Connecticut College did not teach that. Now, on the other hand, 
These aren't women who lacked consciousness. They obviously had strategies for legitimation. Right? They took their women stu students seriously. But what they did do, even if they didn't put Virginia Woolf on the syllabus, is they invited very prominent women of, at the time to come to campus to talk. So there was Alice Paul, at that point quite elderly, but Alice Paul was there on stage. Did any of us crass undergraduates have a clue who we were listening to or looking at? Not a clue, because none of us had learned any suffrage history in high school or college. We just thought, well, you know how, you know how you are when you're 18. I mean, you're just so arrogant. And so you look up on stage and you see an elderly woman. Do you see a radical? Do you see somebody who was force-fed? No, you see an elderly woman that for some reason your faculty decided you had to go here. They also invited Eleanor Roosevelt. Now you'd think we'd be a little better about Eleanor Roosevelt, <laughs> but we were almost wall-to-wall -wall Republican family kids. I think, because I knew the one woman in my dorm who was for Stevenson, right? And when you know the one woman in your dorm is from Stephen, it does say something about the inclinations of the rest of your, your classmates. Um, so all I knew about Eleanor Roosevelt was that she was the object of ridicule. And so once again, I, didn't, I never took Eleanor Roosevelt seriously until I started reading Blanche Wisencook, who I'm sure most of you have read. Um, everyone's waiting for volume three, but don't tell her that because, you know, it's awful when you promise three volumes and you've gotten two and they're fabulous and you should be able to stop, but you're not allowed to stop because everyone says, where's volume three? But it's coming. Um, but until I read Blanche Weiss and Cook's wonderful two-volume biography, I had no clue that Eleanor Roosevelt was a social reformer, that she was a feminist, that she was an anti-racist. I had not, none of that history. So our faculty members invited people that they obviously admired, but somehow couldn't figure out a way to prepare us so that we would overcome our youthful arrogance and actually listen carefully. The person that they did invite who somehow got through my um, protective covering uh, was Hannah Arendt. And Hannah Arendt came um, when I was a senior. And it was just several years um, after her um, uh, uh, publishing of The Origins of Totalitarianism, uh, which I hadn't read. But Hannah Arendt, there was something going on I was sitting kind of towards the back row. Luckily, we'd been required to come. Just keep that in mind with your students. Do require them to go to things, right? So they won't regret 20 years later that they didn't go. Um, and there was something so exciting about Hannah Arendt. Um, I didn't understand what she was talking about. I, it was clearly way over my head. But I was a note taker. I was, I'm a, I'm a big note taker. And so I took notes like crazy. Now, when it was all over, I ran to the campus coffee shop just to think. And that was the impact that Hannah Arendt had on me. I'll tell you one other story about Hannah Arendt. Um, I only have two. That's my other, going to be my other story. And that is when I was out at Berkeley, uh, Sheldon Wolin, who a political theorist, uh, was um, my professor in political theory, and he was a very major Hannah Arendt um, uh, uh, admirer, and so we read a lot of Hannah Arendt, um, thankfully. Um, and the American Political Science Association was meeting over in San Francisco one of the years when I was in graduate school, and so we all went over just to be part of the association meetings, and um, we went to panels, and Sheldon Wallen was chairing a panel on revolutions. Um, and so the panelists were up here and they did their thing and so on. And then Sheldon Wolin said to the audience, which was maybe half of you, um, said to the audience, well, now does anybody, you know, usual, um, does anyone have any comments? And about there, 
a woman stood up and she said, well, I do have a couple of comments. Well, you could, everyone just went, it was Hannah Arendt. And she was, imagine you are on the panel on revolutions. <laughs> and suddenly it dawns on you that you've been listened to by Hannah Arendt, right? And so she stood up and she said, I just have a couple of comments. And of course, they were brilliant. Um, but what was wonderful about Hannah Arendt is that all that time at Berkeley, she was publishing in the New York Review of Books and in the New Yorker. That is, she was publishing with advertisements down the side, right? She was publishing in magazines that you picked up, at least in Berkeley, at the newsstand. She was publishing in public spaces. And I've always remembered that because I thought, well, that's where political theory goes on. That's where philosophy goes on. It goes on in things that you pick up at the newsstand and you go to the coffee shop and you underline. And that's, to me, what made her uh, intellectual life so vibrant is that she was so not necessarily accessible in the sense that you really had to reread and then reread again what she was saying because it was so deep, but that she was so available um, in this kind of forum. Um, after, um, at the end of my uh, year at, or my college career at Connecticut, I had an internship since we're down in Washington. Um, uh, I had an internship with the, if you can believe it, now remember I'm from Manhasset, Long Island. I had an internship in the Department of Agriculture. <laughs> I, I really could hardly tell a tulip from a forsythia, right? But I was assigned to the Department of Agriculture, and I was a gopher uh, for a small group of uh, visiting um, agricultural technicians uh, from, they were all men, from Turkey, Ghana, and Indonesia. And the fellow from Indonesia named Galar Waratmaja. And Galar was a fishery specialist. He'd studied in the Soviet Union, and it is now, think, Indonesia. He was studied in the Soviet Union, and now he was studying in the United States. And he took me under his wing because he was so appalled that I had never heard of the Dutch, I mean, of the Indonesian Revolution against the Dutch. He was just so worried, I think, <laughs> that somebody who was getting this university education knew nothing about the world. And uh, Galar Waratmaja actually had a big impact on me. But the civil servants in the Department of Agriculture across the river here, they got me aside. And they said, now, Cynthia, you cannot go out to dinner with any of these agriculturalists because nobody at a Washington restaurant will seat a white woman with any of these men who are dark-skinned. So Galar and I would go walking in parks, and with my, I had a whole bunch of roommates, we'd all go out to dinner at some pizzeria. But Galar really affected me, and he really opened my eyes well, he made it clear how little I knew, which was wonderful. Um, and what it meant when I went to Berkeley, I chose to, if you will, double major. I was a political scientist at Berkeley, but I was also an Asian studies specialist. And this, I think, really had a, an enormous um, effect on me when, it, when I belatedly became a feminist. because. And those of you who are in area studies, the Asian Studies Association, the African Studies Association, the Baltic um, Studies Association, one of the things that you learn if you become what was then called an area specialist is you have to know everything. You can't possibly study the politics of Malaysia, which turned out to be my dissertation specialty. You can't possibly study the politics of any country in Southeast or East Asia unless you understand architecture, unless you understand the history of colonialism. In Malaysia, unless you understand the politics of tin and the politics of rubber, so that you really took on board as an area specialist that politics could not be understood by just looking at the narrow field of what other people imagined to be politics. And when I went to Malaysia for my dissertation uh, research, in fact, that was one of the things that I was quite overwhelmed by. I was there to study ethnic politics. During my whole time in Malaysia, 
um, year. Um, I never interviewed a single woman, and I didn't notice that I, ever, that I never interviewed a single woman. Um, but what I did imbibe was the sense that I had to read Malaysian literature. I had to understand uh, the history of the sultans, that I had to understand um, the ways in which the history of various Malaysian states, including um, uh, on Borneo, how they affected politics. And this really stood me in a very good stead, I think, when I finally gained some feminist consciousness, because what I had already imbibed were two things from these years of seeming unconsciousness. One is that you can't understand political life unless you take seriously the study of history, the study of art, the study of literature, the study of culture more broadly. And that really kind of laid a foundation for when I did come to feminism, because that's exactly what feminists have argued, that you can't understand political life if you have a narrow understanding of where politics takes place. You have to take seriously my mother to understand World War II, not just my father. My father in World War II was behind Japanese lines in uh, Burma, um, and if any of you grew up on Terry and the Pirates, my father was Doc. Uh, and, but, so my father's stories, he had war stories. My mother, who wasn't on a battlefront, my mother simply coped with wartime. But most historians don't think that they, there's a way to talk about the history of coping. But actually, coping is part of history, and it's usually feminized in wartime. Um, so area studies really stood me in very good stead. The second thing that I learned from these years of seeming unconsciousness was never, never, never to forget to ask the racial or ethnic question. Never assume that there are these people called women. Never assume that you can talk about women as if they are a monolithic group. In any country, in any community, not just nation by nation, but within Malaysia, you wouldn't make uh, uh, generalizations about Malaysian women. You'd ask about Malay women and Tamil women and Chinese women to understand what their political lives were like. So those two lessons, that is, to understand politics, you have to understand cultures. And to understand women's lives, you have to always ask ethnic and racial questions and not be sure what answer you're going to get. My first job after Berkeley was in Miami of Ohio. They had never had a woman in the department. Um, they were quite nervous, um, but they were quite brave. I mean, they did hire me. Um, but what was really interesting is that, well, it's dismaying. What one of the guys in the department, I heard later, on the search committee uh, went kind of behind the scenes and made a phone call to one of my advisors at Berkeley. And the question he asked, guy to guy, was, will she make trouble? Now, you know what's the terrible answer? He said no. <laughs> I mean, isn't that just awful? I was, uh, well, it's just awful. Um, but one of the reasons that my search was somewhat um, eased was that I was on the job market and going from campus to campus having uh, job interviews at the time of the free speech movement where Berkeley became Berkeley. Um, and this was the student-led movement uh, that asked all kinds of difficult questions about university life. Um, and the free speech movement really challenged not just the IBM card. This was the time where they got a dog through graduation. You know, they showed that you could do anything with an IBM card. Um, but it was also asking questions about when could uh, city police come on campus, what kinds of activities could be uh, controlled by the deans. Um, and the free speech movement, I mean, I went out on strike. The, I wasn't by any means any part of any leadership, but um, the, it split the political science department. And I had members of my committee who are on both sides of pro and against the free speech movement. But the free speech, like all social movements, the free speech movement had a social life. And I now realize 
that I really kept a distance from the social life of the free speech movement. And I didn't, at the time, know why, because I had no feminist concepts. Um, all I could say is, ah, I don't think so. So I you know, did the whole strike thing and everything, but I, the partying, I didn't do. It was only later when I read feminist histories of civil rights movements, feminist histories of nationalist movements, feminist histories of anti-colonial movements, only then those feminist histories gave me a sense of what were the dynamics, oftentimes sexualized, highly masculinized in their privileging, of what went on inside social movements. Only then could I kind of name what it was that made me, without the words to describe it, hold back. Now, when I came to Clark University, um, by that time I was teaching um, Southeast Asian studies, comparative politics, but not women's studies. And it was students, undergraduate students, who went to the dean and said, we've heard that there's this thing called women's studies at UMass Amherst, just an hour down the pike. Um, couldn't we have it here? And the dean said, well, I said, I've never heard of such a thing. There's a woman dean. Um, but she said, let's get together the women faculty. I think there were about 10 of us. Um, and we'll have a bag lunch. And the students and we all sat on the floor. And the students made their pitch. And they made a very convincing pitch for why we should have this thing called women's studies. And so my friend Serena uh, offered to give a course on fiction by women writers, both British and the US. My friend Sharon very uh, bravely said that she would figure out what a course on women in American politics would be. And um, they, the students very determinedly uh, pushed me to offer a course on uh, women and comparative politics. And to tell you the truth, there was no turning back. I loved teaching that course, but at the time, the only books to assign were all by historians. That's the good news, right? So I, I filled the course with books by feminist historians of Russian women, feminist historians of Chinese women, feminist historians of the British suffrage movement. It was just, it was so exciting. You know how sometimes you get so excited about your course you almost forget the students are there because right? you're just so worked up, right? And I loved it. And this was a point where I was spending a lot of time in England because I was, this is still in my not quite feminist mode, I was doing a multi-year study of the way racism and ethnocentrism works inside of militaries. I mean, honestly, you could shake me at 2 in the morning and say, who's in the Air Force in Kenya? And I'd say, oh, the Kikuyu. Um, I really tried to understand how um, racism and ethnicity were both manipulated by state elites to build their own sense of militarized security. I spent a long time doing that. Um, but that was my last non-feminist book. But you know when you write your last non-feminist book, you don't know it's your last non-feminist book? I mean, right? Or it wouldn't have been your last non-feminist book. Um, uh, and it was only after that, but I was spending a lot of time in England, and when I was there, British feminists took me under their wing, just like Galar did several years before that, and really made sure that I went to exciting debates and meetings that were you know, full of heat uh, as well as excitement. And I really began to understand how difficult it was to think about the relationship between feminism and socialism, the ways in which you could debate heterosexuality and lesbian feminism. And so these were wonderful debates. I didn't know how to write about them. I didn't know how to teach about them. But I knew that they mattered. So when I first came to writing a feminist book, which is called Does Khaki Become You? Um, it was about uh, women's lives in and around militaries. But by that time, I had realized that militaries, which is what I studied when I was doing the study of racism and ethnocentrism in militaries. I studied military. I began to realize that militaries was just one small part of the arena of militarism. 
Um, and so I literally, on my apartment floor, I remember I had kind of an arc of notes and books that I was trying to turn into chapters. Um, and because, you know, every time you write a book, you try to figure out the chapters. And um, I remember thinking, ah, oh, the biggest stack is about women in militaries. I'm not going to have that the first chapter. I kind of, I remember literally taking and thinking, about chapter five, I think that would be good. What should come earlier uh, is prostitution. That to make sense of women and militaries, women's many relationships to militaries, you had to start with prostitution, about what male military commanders think about prostitution, and here I'm very indebted to Philip Levine, who's here today, um, that you had to be able to think not only about women in prostitution and their relationships with male soldiers, but also male commanders and what imaginings they had about male sexualities and about women who could be controlled uh, within prostitution to satisfy what they thought were the quote unquote sexual drives of male soldiers. Um, so putting prostitution first and then I remember sitting there, I thought, okay, right next to prostitution should come marriage, right? <laughs> that, and Judy Walkowitz makes this point in her groundbreaking study of the anti-CD acts uh, campaigning by British women in the uh, 1870s in Britain, and that is, if you're going to talk about prostitution, you always have to talk about marriage. Um, and so militaries are just as confused, they still are, just as confused about marriage as they are about prostitution. And they usually think of them at the same time because oftentimes the presumption is you foster controlled by them, controlled prostitution for the sake of being able to have a kind of marriage system that works for the military. And military wives which included my mother during World War II, but military wives were never talked about. And in fact, I never learned about marriage because marriage is what sociologists do, right? So as a political scientist, there was no discussion when I was at Berkeley of becoming um, inquisitive about uh, the politics of marriage in order to understand national security. Now, let me just move forward here because what this has done to my um, thinking is means that I have a much broader understanding or curiosity since understanding is still down the road but I have a much broader curiosity about what it takes to militarize people what does it take to militarize women what does it take to militarize men why is militarization so insidious why is it so appealing why, when I go to Fenway Baseball Park in Boston for Red Sox games, I love the Red Sox, um, go, see, we've got another Bostonian here, but why is it that I'm the only one who refuses to stand up when the fighter bomber goes over the stadium to open the game? Why is a weapon of death supposed to be exciting at an American football or baseball um, event? So. I'm still interested in militarism. I think it's one of the reasons that my stuff gets translated. I talk with a lot of people who only read it in translation, which means they ask much harder questions of me than if they had to struggle and read it in English. Translation is very political. It does mean that you have an equal conversation that you might not otherwise have. So I think I'm very, very lucky. I came to feminism pretty late. I had to be nudged. I'm still being nudged by all my good colleagues. Ann Tickner here in the front row and I have um, been together in the effort to try and make international relations as a discipline more curious about gender. Um, it's not easy. Um, it's not a great success oftentimes, but there are a lot more of us than there used to be. Thank you very much.
you all had wine ahead of time, didn't you? That's the, that's the ticket. Always make sure you give a lecture where they have the wine before the lecture. I can see this is really the ticket. But listen, we've, we've still got a bit of time um, that Pauline um, very graciously said would, be, would work. Um, so are there stories? Uh, you don't have to do the Q&A thing. I mean, are there stories? Are there questions? Are there things you just want to? Hi there. Just say your name just a word. Adam Blistein, Society for Classical Studies. Why was your mother a title work? Oh, well, because she was, that's a really good question. She was a, um, uh, quite a privileged uh, young woman. Uh, she'd gone through mills, um, but Lil Holden, her quote unquote foster mother, um, thought she should go to Europe and you know, get more educated. And so she was in Heidelberg as a tourist, as a tourist. I mean, she had, quite, on the one hand, her mother died when she was 12. Her father died before she was finished college. But she was quite privileged in that sense of having those resources and having somebody to guide her was so adventurous and assuming that a young woman shouldn't just stay in California. Yeah, that's why she was in Heidelberg. Yeah, hi. Hi, I'm Allison with the Linguistic Society of America. Hi, Allison. Do you think the UN Studies for Women had a positive impact overall on status of women internationally? Allison, that's a great question. And I want, because I, I, one of the things I want to mention, Pauline was very nice and mentioned this book called Bananas, Beaches, and Bases. Um, when it first came out, it came out from Pandora Press, which is a feminist press, Philippa knows this, a feminist trade press in London. Naomi Schneider, this is all the way to answer your question, Naomi Schneider was an editor who I at that point didn't know at University of California Press. And Naomi got in touch with Candida Lacey, who was my editor in London, and said, we might be interested in co-publishing. And of course, for a small press, to get a co-print run means that you lower your production costs. So Candida came to me and she said, oh, University of California Press is really interested in publishing Bananas, Beaches, and Bases. And I said, no. I said, I don't want this book to come out from a university press. I said, I'm afraid it will just taint it and the people that I'm really hoping will read it and make use of it and critique it, they won't find it if it's got a university press imprint on it. And Canada said, yeah, but Pandora. And she said, really, Naomi seems like a feminist. And you know, I said, well, OK. You know, because authors, you don't get to bargain much, right? But I said, but I was working with a feminist press. Now, this really makes a difference. So Canada actually listened to me. I said, OK, but here's the deal. Carmen Miranda has to stay on the cover. <laughs> I, I don't know what my image of a university press book was at that point, but I didn't think it usually included Cam Carmen Miranda. And she said, OK, no, I, I'm sure Naomi can persuade her design department. And they did. And that, I think, because it then came out in paperback from a university press, I think it's one of the reasons it got adopted in American. If it had come out in the United States, quote unquote, just from Pandora, I'll bet you it wouldn't have gotten picked up for adoption. That's all our problem of what we take seriously. But what also was true, it came out during the, decade, the UN Decade on Women. And a lot was happening in American women's studies. There was this growing sense that we're too parochial. There was this growing sense that we only are studying the American women's and girls' experience, even if we're trying to be less white in our understanding of American women's diverse experiences, we're studying American women's experience. And there was that consciousness that was beginning to bubble up. The other thing is, and this is why I introduced Ann Tickner here, is because Ann's book groundbreaking book of political theory of international relations on gender and international relations, capital I, capital R, meaning the discipline, came out just a couple of years or maybe a year after uh, Bananas did. And that was kind of the perfect storm. The, U the UN decade raised consciousness, especially the Nairobi meetings at the end of the decade. Then the 
increasing understanding by women's studies faculty members in the United States that we have to kind of get more worldly, be less parochial. And the third was the gender and international relations movement that Anne really uh, sparked. And all those three things, I think, had an effect. I think the UN Decade of Women, all the, the three conferences, Mexico City, Copenhagen, and Nairobi. And if any of you are looking for topics for your students, because it's now history, look at the difference in the political dynamics of Mexico City, Copenhagen, and Nairobi. They're really different. By the time you get to Nairobi, you have a lot more local activists coming to the meeting, a lot more discussions about local activism, about the roles of racism and sexism together. It was a really um, mind-expanding meeting. That laid the groundwork for 1995 and the uh, UN Decade Plus 10 that happened in, in Beijing, by which time you had a lot more anti-militarist um, women coming to the meetings. Yes, I think it did have an impact. That's the short answer. <laughs> yeah, hi. Yeah, I think that's you. Yeah. Well, I'd... If you go to the Nationals game, for example, it's the entire introduction is in celebration of the military. Yes, I, it's, really, it's quite striking to me. And it's striking at, at several levels. I mean, I actually think the NFL is more militarized. We could have a debate here. But simply because the Pentagon only advertises during football games and NASCAR. The, and they make this very, they're very clear about the strategy, about listen to Pentagon advertising budget people and their Madison Avenue firms, and they make big decisions about where they advertise. They advertise during NFL games and during NASCAR. They don't advertise during tennis, right? <laughs> they, right? It's all about their notion, not just of the masculinity of the sport, but of the viewers, right? But they also don't advertise during baseball games. But, and this gets to, this, the, the heroization, if that's a word, of the, our men and women in uniform and veterans has really taken over the pre-game um, ceremonies of most baseball um, companies, baseball franchises. And it's, it's, worth, it's worth really trying to figure this out because it didn't happen in the 1980s. I think it's, and it's not just a post-Vietnam, as they say, kind of guilt thing. It, I think it really, you can, see, well, there's a study. I think you can really see the upswing after the Gulf, first Gulf War, and especially during Iraq and Afghanistan. But there is this notion that whatever we did wrong, we, that's all of us, Civilians did wrong after the Vietnam War by not honoring our veterans. We're now going to make up for that. But I think it's also because it is a men's sport. That is, they don't bring out any veterans during the WNBA, right? If any of you go to women's basketball. I mean, there are plenty of women veterans. They don't do any of that there. It's, it's a very particular combination of assumptions and aspirations. So look into it, folks. Be, sports history is so interesting, right? Not to mention iconography. Hi. Hi, I'm Nicholas Courtright, uh, vice chair of the ACLS from Everett College, Massachusetts. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you haven't placed yourself in relation to the feminist movement in the U.S., and I wondered um, why you didn't talk about that much. You said that the feminist consciousness really came about just because your students said we need to force it on women. Well. Yes, yeah, well, there's always, there are always reasons. Um, I think the thing that really, well, you know, you know when you track yourself back, I, was, I subscribed to Ms. Magazine when the very first issue of Ms. was a supplement inside New York Magazine. It was a kind of stapled in supplement, right? And then it became freestanding. Um, and I subscribed to that issue of New York Magazine when Ms. was, I didn't keep it. 
Mm, I know. Um, but when it was stapled in. The other thing is, at about the same time, this would have been just when I was starting at Clark. Um, I also subscribed to Billie Jean King's Women's Sports. So something was happening to my you know, dormant consciousness. But the other thing that really had a big effect on me was um, a case, well, it became a case. There was a complaint. Uh, I won't make the story too long, but it's an important one. A, a Chilean anthropologist, who the anthropologists here know, a Chilean anthropologist named Jimena, with an X, Jimena Bunster, uh, was a visiting professor in our department, in, in the sociology and anthropology department that was right across the hall from me. And Jimena came into my office. You know, there's, there's always the time when a student or a faculty colleague comes into your office and closes the door, right? And then you slow way down. And Jimena went on to describe what her sociology chair, a man, was doing. And it was horrible. And she had, she was a pro um, Allende exile. She had stood up to the junta. She was quite a determined person, but she was on a visa. She was on a temporary visa that could be canceled at any moment by her department chair. So I went to feminist friends of mine in New Words Bookstore, the famous um, uh, bookstore in uh, Boston, which also had the effect of turning me into a feminist. Nothing like a good bookstore to you know, change your consciousness. And I said to my friend Gilda Bruckman, who was one of the core um, people at New Words, I said, who should we, how should I help Jimena? How can I, where, where can we talk about this? And she said, you know, there's a group of five women here in Boston called Ask, As Association Against Sexual Coercion, and said they're working with women in factories over in Chelsea, a working class neighborhood of Boston, about what to do when they are hit upon by their male foreman in the factories. Go talk to her. And so Jimena and I went in, and this wonderful woman, Nancy, said to Jimena, just tell me what's happening in your workplace. Just describe what is happening. So she described what was happening. And this woman, Nancy, looked at both of us and said, that is what we now call sexual harassment. And Jimena, who's a feminist anthropologist, and I looked at each other and looked at her and said, say those two words together. We had never heard those words. And in fact, what it taught me, we, it, the case took three years. Finally, the university administration, which had been backing the male faculty member, or at least was afraid of him, um, woke up. It, it ended well, but it ended well after ulcers, after double mortgages to pay for lawyers, all kinds of things. Adrian Rich came and did a benefit. But what it taught me in the long run was, listen to activists. They oftentimes are the first to conceptualize things that we can then use to make sense of the world. Thanks a lot, everybody. Oh my goodness. I, I think we, we, could have, we could have told, listened to Cynthia's no. stories no. until dinner was over, but but we need to let you have a glass of wine. Okay, it's a deal. <laughs> but please, uh, please join us for the reception and dinner. Um, I think you know it's it's the least we can offer you. But um, and um, and here's some more stories from Cynthia. I'm sure over dinner. Um, thank you. This is the Charles Homer Haskins. Look at that. Surprise. That's beautiful. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> You're so pleased.